today we're going to be honing in, I think, on one of the most critical decisions you can make in your life, and that is seizing this moment to look at your friends. Friends, from the very beginning, God created us to be in relationships. We hear that in the very first book of the Bible. Adam and Eve. God created us to be in relationships. And it is perhaps one of the most crucial decisions we will make. In fact, if you think about it, you are a sum total of every relationship you've ever been in. How people have treated you, not treated you, what someone told you when you were in grade school. We have been shaped all by our relationships. And every day, people are coming across our walk of faith, trying to be in a relationship with us. Some of those people are good people. They mean us well. They're trying to lift us up and encourage us. They don't just tell us what we want to hear. They kind of tell us what we need to hear. They're people that God has put in our life to help us to go to the next level in our walk of faith. But let's be honest. Sometimes we can have people that come in our life that may not be helping us in our walk of faith. Sometimes these people are negative. They're people that are not going anywhere. People that just smile at whatever you say, never really challenge you to go farther in your walk of faith. They're just in your life. And you have to understand this important lesson. How you feel about yourself will draw those same kind of people into your life. You're like a magnet. How you feel about you will draw people to you. In other words, if you're focused and you're goal-oriented, you want to accomplish great things in your life, and you're positive, let me tell you, you're going to hang around with, you're going to lean on people that are goal-oriented, that are focused, that are going places. But the opposite is true. If you're hanging around with the Debbie Downers of the world, negative people, people that are not going anywhere, people that are just kind of stagnant, never trying to challenge you, catapult you or move you to the next level, then let me tell you something. Just like a magnet, you're going to draw those same people to you. It's like that whole saying that says, birds of a feather flock together. Well, some of us are hanging around and flocking around the wrong people. Today, I want to encourage you to look at that magnet in your life. Who are you drawing in to your life? You know, when I was in seventh grade, I have to tell you and be straight up with you that I wasn't the best student. In fact, my seventh grade year, I don't think my parents thought I was even going to pass, to be honest with you. Struggling greatly in school, really never even wanted to be there. Didn't really know what my purpose was, didn't really have a focus. I just didn't like school, straight up, just didn't like school at that time. And all my friends were just like me, because I was drawing those people in. People that really weren't going anywhere, people that just weren't focused, people that didn't have any kind of goals in mind. I started to attract those same kind of people. And it started to impact my grades. In fact, one semester, confession right here, I ended up not getting, I almost was failing. That's how bad I was doing because of the people that I was drawing in with my magnet. And I'll never forget my seventh grade teacher, God love her if she's watching, probably not, but if she is, her name is Miss Vermillion. Miss Vermillion told me something that I'll never forget. She said, Nick, let me tell you, the people that you're choosing to hang around today will oftentimes determine your destiny tomorrow. That short statement, I can't tell you that it was like a magical moment that I just started changing and started doing A's in school because God knows that that didn't happen. But the important thing was is that that message of who you're hanging around today, who that magnet is attracting will oftentimes determine your destiny tomorrow. Fast forward 20 years at my high school reunion. Went there expecting to see all my friends that I saw 20 years prior. And some of those same people that I was drawing in, that I was hanging out with, to be quite honest with you, and I say this totally respectfully towards them, but some of them had never even changed. Some of them were still the same old kids, same old mentality, not going anywhere, never achieving the purpose that God had in store for them. Let me give you the words of Mr. Vermillion to let it rest on your heart. Who are the people that are hanging out in your life right now? Who are the people that you're drawing in like a magnet to make you better? Are you hanging around people that are not challenging you, that are not moving you to the next level? Who you hang out today will determine your destiny tomorrow. I want you to open up your Bibles. We're going to be honing into perhaps one of my favorite miracles that I see Jesus do, and that's on page 48 of, the, of our Bibles. It's Mark chapter 2, and as we do with every single time that we're giving a message 
we don't want to just give you a Bible verse and just tell you this is what it means and without really even giving you some context by which it's written. So let me just give you a little bit of a context. So Jesus was in Galilee. He's just leaving Galilee to go to Capernaum. Capernaum is 85 miles from Jerusalem, just to kind of give you a little bit of a proximity. Jesus in the New Testament, we hear, performs 37 miracles. 37 miracles. Now, we, there are many more that we don't even hear about because the last line in the book of John, our patron saint says that if I was to write down all of the miracles that Jesus did, that the earth itself could not contain the books. But of the ones that are written about, there are 37 of them. This is one of them. Here, Jesus is at a house, and his notoriety is growing. So people known as Pharisees are showing up. Who are these Pharisees that we hear constantly about? They're not part of a priesthood per se. They are part of the people that were holding fast to the Mosaic law. They were very literal about the law itself. And anything that deviated from the Mosaic law and what God had taught in the Torah or the Old Testament as we know it was amartia. It was a sin. And so they were hearing about the notoriety of this man called Jesus. He was just starting out his ministry, so they showed up. They showed up to this house along with many other people who were hearing about Jesus. The house was totally packed. Then something extraordinary happens. Four people end up carrying one man who has been paralyzed for a long time. He just can't walk. We don't know how old he is. We don't know how long he's been that way. But we see these four friends taking him to the house where Jesus was. What they do afterwards is perhaps one of the most extraordinary visual thoughts that one can have. They take him up on a roof. Now let me tell you how a house in Capernaum looked like. It wasn't like a house that we have today in Jacksonville. The homes were not made with shingles. They were a wooden plank, a wooden piece of wood that was above a truss. Then above that little piece of wood, almost like a piece of plywood, was reeds that they would gather from the trees. Some of those same reeds they would use later as they're waving Jesus on Palm Sunday. But here these reeds would be on the roof, and then they would take clay, and they would mix it all up and put it on top of those reeds. That's how the roofs look like. So the persistence of these four friends, knowing what Jesus could do in their life, they take him up on the roof because there's no space inside to bring this person, their friend, who's been paralyzed. And they literally cut a hole out. And if you've ever seen a painting of this, it's truly extraordinary. And then they lower this man. And then something happens. I want you to pick this up on chapter 2, verses 4. It says this, Because of the crowd, however, they could not get the man to Jesus. So they made a hole in the roof right above the place where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, this is where it gets great, they let the man down. So just imagine, you're at a roof, it's about 12, 13 feet high, they're lowering this man down, and then it says, Jesus, seeing not the man who's paralyzed, how much faith he had, they said, seeing how much faith they had. Who is they? The friends. Because he saw their faith, he heals that man. And the story goes on about how these Pharisees are arguing and all that. But let me ask you today, who are the people in your life? Ask yourself, think about it. Who are the people in your life that are carrying you towards Christ? If you can't think of someone that's helping you grow closer to Christ, we might need to reassess our friendships. We might need to love them still from a distance, but they may not be the people that are carrying us to where Christ needs us to be. So let me ask you this question. What are the things that we need to look for in a friendship? You know, it's a famous saying that goes, friendship is like a book. It takes years to write, but only minutes to burn. Take time when you're looking for the friends in your life. Make sure that those friends are lifting you up are not keeping you the same place, that are catapulting you, that are challenging you in your faith, that are making you grow in your faith. What shouldn't you be looking for in a relationship with friends are people in which you're the biggest fish in the tank. If you're the smartest person in your group, your group is too small. 
If you're not hanging around people that are going to challenge you and help you grow, then let me encourage you, you're getting lazy, you're getting stale, and God wants you to do something greater. Think of it like this. In 1962, Neil Sadaka wrote, I think, one of the most coolest songs ever. Many of you will know this song very well. But it became the number one song on the top 100 Billboard songs. And it goes a little bit like this. Excuse me, my voice is not doing too well today. Allergies are bothering me. But it goes a little bit like this. It goes, down, doobie, do, down, down, doobie. You know that song. I'm sure you will sing it with me quietly. But anyway, and then the, the chorus to this song is what? Breaking up is hard to do. Let me make it to you very clear. If you're in a relationship right now that's not going anywhere, if the people that are in your life are not challenging you to grow, hold, grow bigger and grow better in your walk of faith, then yes, breaking, hard, breaking up is hard to do, but if you keep hanging around with them, you're going to be going down, dooby doo down, down. <laughs> to those of you that are dating or in a dating relationship right now, let me just give you a word of encouragement. If the person you're dating right now is not helping you, is not making you be a better person, if you're the one who's actually making them get better, let me tell you something. Yes, breaking up is hard to do, but if you hang around with them, check it out. Down, dooby doo, down, down for you. <laughs> Young people, if you're in at school and you don't want to hang around, if you're like me and just want to hang around people that are not going anywhere, not being challenged, just kind of hang around with the people that are cool, let me tell you something. If they're not helping you grow, yes, breaking up is hard to do, but the consequences are what? Down, doobie, doo, down, down. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of letters about that one, but my point is, is that you've got to make sure because your life is too short and your soul is too valuable to be hanging around people that are going to take you down. You've got to find people that are going to take you up. i leave you with this. In 1938, the Olympic Games were being held in Berlin, Germany. It was probably the, one of the most contentious times in our history, in the recent history. Adolf Hitler's power was growing. There was enormous amount of stress going on all throughout the world. And everything honed in, and the world's attention came onto Berlin, Germany. And there was this African-American man named Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens was not that much welcomed right here in our own country, to be quite honest with you. There was no civil rights movement at that time or law that was passed. And then he was going to a place where the white race, and specifically the German race, was the supreme race. And so you just imagine tens of thousands of people in Berlin Stadium, and they're watching this black man, Jesse Owens, attempt to do the long-distance jump. He goes the first time and he runs. He hits the line that he's not supposed to hit, the line that proceeds before you take the jump. And when you touch that line, when your foot touches it before you jump, it's a disqualification. You only are able to get two disqualifications before you're totally disqualified. Does it the first time, hits the line, misses it. The entire Berlin Stadium is roaring in excitement. Jesse Owens, he ain't going to do it this time. Does it again, runs. Hits the line again, disqualified again. The entire Berlin Stadium, Adolf Hitler's present, clapping. Jesse Owens ain't going to do it. And then probably one of the most extraordinary events in Olympic history was a man named Luz Long. He goes up. He's a German. Adolf Hitler had put a lot of weight into this man. He wanted him to beat Jesse Owens. He goes up to Jesse Owens, Luz Long puts his arm around him, and he says, Jesse, in his broken English, he says, you've done this many times before. You can do it. Break the world record. This was his competitor. Adolf Hitler's in the stands. Puts in and says, you can do it. Jesse Owens backs up, runs so fast, Right before that line, jumps 26 feet and would end up breaking the world record. He says later that he would melt. You should read about this. This is truly extraordinary. 
He would melt all of his gold medals because it would never compare to the friendship that he had with Luz Long. Who's taking you to your gold medal? Who's taking you to the gold medal of your faith? Take inventory of the people that are in your life. Some of those people, friends, they're coming in your life, they're not helping you grow. They're not challenging you to go further. Time is ticking. We won't have forever. Like Ms. Vermillion said, who you choose to hang around with today will have a major determination on who you become tomorrow. If you're hanging around with people that are not going places, that can't call you out in a positive way, yes, breaking up is hard to do, but the alternative is this, down, be do down, down. Seize the moment, because time is ticking. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.